Hey guys, thanks for checking out this week's message. At Hope City, we're always so encouraged to hear how God is bringing the hope of Jesus to people through this ministry. If God has used this ministry to bring hope to your life, we'd love to hear about it. To share your story, you can email us at lifechange at hopecityonline.net. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can simply text any amount to the number on the screen. It's a safe and secure way to support the work God is doing here at Hope City. Now, let's prepare our hearts for a message out of God's Word. Man, I'm telling you, I got a word for y'all today. I am stoked. I'm excited. Not necessarily because this is something I've been looking forward to for months or because this fell on the calendar just right. I, I, I'm so excited this morning because I believe that what God wants to say to you and what God wants to say to me is extremely timely in your life and in my life. One of the privileges that I have as the pastor of this church is the opportunity to hear about what God is doing or not doing in your lives, to hear about the specific ways that you're seeing the move of God and the ways that you're struggling looking for God's move. And consistently over and over and over again, there seems to be this recurring theme. And it just so happens that God's revelation and God's word through the unveiling of his scriptures fits exactly where we are in this season of the majority of our lives. And so my heart and my prayer is that you'll open yourselves up to what it is that God wants to say and do in you specifically this morning. Now, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Robbie, and I am privileged to be one of the pastors here at Hope City. If I have not had the opportunity to meet you yet, I'd love the chance to get to do that. I'll be hanging out by the door um, after this worship experience is over. Please stop by, say hello, give me the opportunity to hear your story. And, um, and let me just tell you something. If I've met you before, like a year and a half ago, but then you just decided you were never going to speak to me again, stop by and say hello again. I promise I don't bite. I would love the chance to hang with you guys and talk to you and, um, and hear what God is doing in your midst. If you've got your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them up to the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, Old Testament book of 2 Kings. We're going to read about one of God's prophets named Elisha. Elisha, and I'm pretty excited about this because, again, I really feel like that what Elisha sees going on in 2 Kings here is what a lot of us have going on in our lives, and the parallels are absolutely phenomenal to look at. Now, we've been in a series over the last several weeks called 18-inch Journey, and the series is all about moving from here to here. Moving from our understanding of God and our realization of, of who God is and what he wants to do academically or information-based to consumed and application-driven. We want to move from a place of understanding who God is to knowing who God is. And when this 18-inch journey takes place, it transforms and it changes everything. And today I want to point out a distinct difference between seeing things from here and knowing things from here. Seeing things from here and knowing things from here. I think it's interesting that God put our eyes in our head, close to our brains. Because here's what we do. We see things and then that computes in our brains and we make decisions based on what we see around us. But often what we see with our eyes around us is not all that's going on around us. And if we always continue to operate based on what we see, then we'll never operate based on what we know. And God's challenge to you and to me this morning is to get to a place where we operate based on who he is and what we know about him rather than what we see around us. That's exactly what the scenario Elisha finds himself in, 2 Kings chapter 6. Scripture says this, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid. The prophet answered. Now, I need to hit pause here for a second because there's a distinction here, and I don't want you to miss it. This isn't just another story. God's got implications and applications for your life. 
there are two people, two characters that have already been introduced to us in the story. One is a servant. The other is the prophet. One operates from here. The other operates from here. One sees things and responds accordingly. One knows things and responds accordingly. God's not looking for a church just filled with servants who see things. He's looking for a church of prophets who know things. Somebody who's going to make a difference in our city, who's going to reshape the spiritual landscape of our families and our communities based on who God is and what he's doing in our midst. God's looking for prophets among us. Don't be afraid. See the difference? One is, oh no, what are we going to do? The other is, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elijah prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I'll lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria. Not only was Elisha faithful, he was a jerk. He said, I'm not just going to lead you away from us. I'm going to lead you to a bunch of people I don't even like. You can deal with them. And he led them to Samaria. It's so fascinating that Elisha's response was not based on what his eyes could see. His response was based on what his heart could see. I think God is saying to you and to me today, there's a lot of stuff that's surrounding you. There's a lot of stuff that's overwhelming you. There's a lot of stuff that's getting in the way. There's a lot of stuff that's frustrating you. There's a lot of things that are freaking you out right now, corporately and personally. There's a lot that's going on around you. But I don't want you to operate by what you can see going on around you. I want you to operate based on what you can see going on around it. See, one of the things I learned a long time ago is that while I'm struggling and being overwhelmed by the things of this world, it's because I'm forgetting that the things of this world are being overwhelmed by the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And it's when I forget that that I get overwhelmed. It's when I forget that that I allow those things to consume me. And the Apostle Paul wanted to remind the church in Philippi of the exact same reality. So he did so in a passage of Scripture, Philippians chapter 4, where there's a verse that is insanely familiar to you that I would venture to guess the majority of us take out of context more times than not. Kick on over to Philippians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, the verse will be on the screens for you. Instead of picking it up in the popular verse, verse 13, we're going to back up one and look at verse 12 because verse 12 sets the context for verse 13. Paul says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty, but I've learned the secret of being content in any in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Basically, whether I've got the enemies surrounding me, whether things are bad in my life or whether things are good in my life and I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm on the open road and nothing's going wrong, whether everything seems to be falling apart in my marriage or in my finances or at my job or everything seems to be going swimmingly, I have learned the secret to being content in both arenas and it has nothing to do with looking at what's going on around me. It has everything to do with this next verse. Look what it says. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. See, most of the time we see this verse plastered up on like a gym locker room. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or we see it written on, you know, someone's arm via a tattoo. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
or we see it used as a verse of encouragement when someone is trying to, to accomplish something big in their life. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But this verse wasn't just about lifting the next weight class. This verse wasn't just about accomplishing the next thing. This verse was saying, hey, when you accomplish it, great. And when you don't accomplish it, great. When things work out in your favor, awesome. And when they fall apart, it's still awesome. When things are going well and they've, they've, they've occurred exactly the way you've meticulously planned them out and when everything in your life is going wrong, both times, Christ is giving you strength. Christ is covering you. Christ is coming alongside you. Christ is overwhelming what's around you. When you are surrounded by the enemy and there's no way out, you can even find joy there. How? Through Christ who gives you strength. Are the enemies of your life stronger than you? Yes. Are the things that you're facing bigger than you have the capacity to handle? Yes. But they are not stronger than the Lord. And they are not bigger than the Lord's capacity to handle. And the reminder to you and to me is that we can face with hope any situation, any circumstance in Christ, but it will require us to stop looking at the circumstance as the source of life and begin looking beyond the circumstance at the Christ who is over everything. See the difference? One is looking from here. The other is knowing from here. And then he gives a prime example to these Philippians. He says, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. When I was going through it and life was tough, you guys were great. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. He said, man, back in the day when I was just getting started, everybody was cheering me on, everybody was saying, yay, Paul, what nobody opened in their pocketbooks, what nobody supporting me, what nobody taking care of me, but you guys did. Not because you had a lot, not because you were wealthy, not because you, you, you had a little left over from last year, and so you decided to give it to whatever charity sounded good. No, you gave faithfully and sacrificially when nobody else was doing it. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. That's fascinating to me. That Paul is in one place and he's being supported by a group of people from another place. You sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. He's talking about spiritually. I have received full payment and have more than enough. And look what he says. I am amply supplied now that I've received from Ephroditus the gifts that you sent. They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Here's what I know. You were faithful when you didn't have a lot. You believed when you didn't have a lot. You were generous when you didn't have a lot. You looked at the account and you said, nope, I don't see that I have the capacity to give. But you knew that you were serving the God who is far greater than what you could see. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. You gave. Not because of what you saw. You gave because of what you knew. And that is that your riches didn't come from your hands. They came from your heavenly Father. So you were faithful to your heavenly Father. God was gracious and merciful to you. As a result, you were faithful to him. This is how God wants us to operate. This is how God wants us to live. This is the posture and the position that God wants us in. That we are who he calls us to be 
even when failure is all around us, even when we are in need. You know something I've learned? I've learned that I get to see God's provision far greater when I'm in need than when I have plenty. I get to see the work of God when things aren't going well far more than when they are. I get to see his faithfulness more clearly in my failure than when I've got it all together. See, it's when things aren't going well, when I'm surrounded like Elisha was, that I begin to see the move and the hand and the work of God. God's desire for you and God's desire for me is to be able to say, I look not at my circumstances, not at what's going on right around me. I look to the hills. Psalm 121, what's it say? I look to the hills where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You know what I love about that verse? The maker of heaven and earth, that descriptor of the Lord. Is it said when the earth is caving around you, you remember who made the earth. When circumstances and things and issues start getting in the way, you remember who's in control of those circumstances. And you respond accordingly. Now, what does this ultimately look like? How do you tangibly do this? How do you operate from here rather than from here? How do you, how do, you do what, what was said in the, the first passage? How do you have eyes to see the Lord over the circumstance? There's one very specific word, and it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. One of my favorite verses in all of the scripture. For we live by faith, not by sight. You're looking for something tweetable today? I got nothing for you. Just post this. For we live by faith, not by sight. For we live by faith, not by sight. For we live by faith, not by sight. You say, Robbie, why are you saying that over and over again? Because we flipping don't. We don't. You have no idea how many meetings I have fielded over the last three months in reference to our move as a church. And every single meeting is about what you could see, not what you believed. Every single meeting was about what was, what was right in front of us rather than what was beyond us. The majority of the meetings that I feel about what's going on in your lives and how things are falling apart in your lives and what's going on in your world has everything to do with what you can see, not what you know. The Apostle Paul says, listen, if you're going to begin to be prophets in this land rather than just servants of the land, if you're going to begin to make a difference in such a way that people begin to take notice, if you're going to be able to stand with chariots of fire surrounding you and be confident in the goodness and graciousness of the Lord in the process, it will require you to stop living the way that you're living. How are you living? By sight, not by faith. And God is saying to you and to me today, whether it's corporately or personal in your life, stop looking from here. Stop it. Quit it. You know better. But you're still choosing to use these instead of this. How do I start using this? By faith. Faith. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, things not seen, things not understood, things not figured out. My favorite three words, at least they have been over the last three months, have become, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but we're looking to you for leadership and guidance. I don't know. Yeah, but I need you to give me some clear answers. I don't know. We're going to find a pastor who does know. Well, go ahead, because I don't. I don't know. Because I've made the conscious decision I'm not going to live by sight anymore. 
I'm going to live by faith. And that requires something. That requires resting in I don't know. But I believe. I don't know. But I believe. Here's what I want you to do this morning. Very, very practical. Very, very practical. I want you to think of a situation in your life that is overwhelming you at the moment. I want you to think of a situation or relationship or circumstance that is a mess. And I want you to describe it in your head in one sentence. Just think of it right now. Describe it in your head in one sentence. Either my marriage is a dead end or she won't act right or he won't get his junk together or I don't know how we're going to make it because I lost my job or whatever it is. Think of one sentence in your life that is frustrating you, that's driving you nuts, that's ripping your heart out. Got it? Everybody got it? And now I want you to place these two words after it. But God. But God. Elisha, we're surrounded. It's over. The enemy has the high ground. Chariots of fire all around. There's no way in our strength that we have the ability to get out of this mess. But God, He can. He has. And He will. They're powerful. But God is more powerful. They're strong, but God is stronger. They're terrifying, but God will terrify them. Think of whatever it is in your life right now. Whatever's overwhelming you, whatever's getting in the way. Because that first sentence is an assessment from your eyes. And how you begin that second sentence is a proclamation of faith from your heart. I don't see it. It doesn't make any sense. I don't understand it. But I believe it in faith. But God. This is all falling apart. But God can't seem to get this situation straightened out but God they just won't get their junk together but God see so Robbie why are you being so emphatic about this because this statement right here changes watch this not just what we do it changes who we are say, why is that important? Because you better be ready when God takes us across the line, when God takes us into uncharted territory, when God moves us into a season that's bigger than our capacity to handle. You better be ready when the enemy begins to attack your thought life and your heart because of what you're a part of. Talk to a buddy of mine this week who's going on a missions trip. He was leaving Friday to leave to go on this missions trip. And he said that Monday through Thursday were the worst days of his life ever. And I reminded him, hey, you're going to do the work of the Lord. And the enemy would love nothing more than to get in your way, to rob you of your focus and to distract you from your work. Why is it important that this is who you are? Because you're getting ready to go on mission for the Lord. You're getting ready to do something that nobody else in town, nobody else in our region has ever done before. We're getting ready to be a part of a move of God in such a way 
that other people from around the world will begin to take notice. And if you aren't ready, if God hasn't formed your heart in such a posture and a position that you say, yes, things are falling apart at home. Yes, my kids won't act right. Yes, my marriage seems to be struggling right now. Yes, finances are a mess. Yes, I don't understand why we're doing what we're doing. But God, if you're not in that posture, you'll fall apart. You will be consumed. But when you become a person who says, I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight, God can use you to change the world. God can literally use you to change the world. And God can use you to change your world. But it will require you to move from a position of seeing from here. Take an 18-inch journey and begin seeing from here. Think about it. Pray about it. Wrestle with it. Because if we don't, we will falter and we will fail. I'll close with this. Jesus had a buddy. His name was Peter. Peter wanted to be like Jesus. Peter wanted to do the crazy stuff that Jesus did. Peter wanted to have the notoriety and the opportunities that Jesus had until he went to the cross. But that's another story for another day. But Jesus was walking on water. And he knew Peter wanted to be like him. So he said to Peter, hey, why don't you come out and walk on it too? And per the invitation of Jesus, Peter got out and was the first human being in the history of the world to ever be his own human life raft. He got out and he walked on water. Unbelievable miracle. But the scripture tells us that he began to sink, began to falter. Why? Because the position of his eyes, he began to look at what was around him rather than who invited him. He began to move from a place of complete, reckless abandon, belief, trust, and faith to a place of sight. I'm convinced that if you would be willing to day after day after day get up and say, I don't get it, I don't understand it, it doesn't make any sense to me, it's difficult right now, but God, and keep your faith in Him, you can do crazy stuff. You can do walk on water kind of stuff. Listen, the miracles of the scripture didn't stop when the scripture was canonized. The miraculous can still take place today. You know why it doesn't? Because too many of us are operating from here rather than from here. Keep your eyes on Jesus and let the waves do their thing. Because we serve the God who commands the waves to obey him. Walk and rest in that starting today and every single day.